Well, good morning, folks. Uh, welcome back to Three's Inn. Hope everyone survived the New Year's. I did. Anyway, um, I thought I'd take a moment here, uh, maybe a couple moments, to tell you about how I got here, how I got into pilot training. It was not an easy road, to say the least. From the time I was four, five, six, somewhere in that time frame, uh, I wanted to fly. Not only did I want to fly, I wanted to fly for the United States Air Force. I was just mesmerized by Air Force airplanes. In 1950, when I was four, we moved up to Selfridge Air Force Base, and for the next uh, 13, 14 years, we bounced around uh, airfields all around the world, from Selfridge to Kadena in Okinawa, to uh, davis Monthan, Ramey, Puerto Rico, from Ramey, we went to Westover, Westover to Chamblay, France, and then uh, Wiesbaden, where I graduated from high school. At um, uh, In Okinawa, I remember watching B-29s fly. And then at uh, DM, davis Monthan, I remember seeing B-47s fly with those loud engines and the black smoke. Man, that was exciting. And uh, they also had KC-97 tankers. The uh, KC-135s were just coming on. And then we got down to Ramey. I uh, remember watching B-36s fly. Those things were huge. And then I, uh, we saw the uh, lengthening and hardening of the runway to accept B-52s. From there, um, we went on up to Westover, which was a B-52 KC-135 base. And then in 1962, we went over to uh, Chamblay, France, where they had F-84Fs and uh, B-66s. And then from there up to Wiesbaden, which was more of a support base, as many of us know, they had T-39s, I think, out at uh, Wiesbaden Airfield. At any rate, I grew up around Air Force uh, airplanes all my life, and I just, I just loved them. I loved the sound of them. I loved the smell of them. Uh, and I was just mesmerized by the uh, pilots. We had had a um, uh, Thunderbird demonstration at uh, Chamblay one day, and uh, when it was over, I, uh, on that next Monday morning, I walked in the O Club, and with these three guys sitting there in uh, flight suits, I didn't have a clue who they were. I think I thought they were the Thunderbirds or part of the Thunderbirds. So I had my autograph book with me. I took it over and asked the three of them if they would sign it. Now, these three guys kind of shied away. They weren't sure who this kid is, but they saw my passion, I suppose. And uh, they very graciously signed my book. And um, then they finished their breakfast and went on away. But like I said, I was just, I looked at those up at those guys. They were my heroes. And... Um, so everything was kind of on track, um, but I began to get some insight into the challenges ahead. Uh, when I was uh, at um, Westover, Massachusetts, uh, my sophomore year, mom had gone out to the O Club, mom and dad had gone out to the O Club, and they ran into this uh, eye doctor who had Navy experience. And he said, he said, he asked mom, he said, how, um, how's your son's eyes? And she said, well, 2020, as far as I know. And he said, well, he said, my office is just off base. Why don't you get the kid and bring him out to the office and I'll do an eye exam. And that was about 8.30, 8 o'clock, 8.30 on Friday afternoon. So mom calls me up and says, hey, I'm going to come home and pick you up. You're going in for an eye exam. And I said, well, okay. So she took me down there to the, his clinic and he gave me an eye exam and everything was fine. You have 20-20, but it seems like you have a um, uh, deficiency in your color vision. Well, that didn't make any sense to me because I could see colors just as well as the next person or so I thought. I never had any problem seeing colors. But anyway, he said, yeah, you're just kind of borderline. So, okay, fine. There was something in me that uh, knew what he said, but I just couldn't accept it. I just, I wasn't, I wasn't willing to accept it. So I graduated from high school in Wiesbaden and came back to Bowling Green and entered the ROTC program. 
everything went fine for the first uh, three years. And then um, the end of my junior year, I registered for FIP, Flight Instruction Program, for my senior year. And that was fine till the end of summer in the first week or two of um, class there in uh, fall semester. I had to go down to Wright-Patterson and take a flight physical. Not a problem. So I go down there and um, I flunked the color vision test. They had, um, they gave it to me in those pink and green dots on those number plates and uh, I flunked it just by one or two. If you have 13 plates, you've got to be able to see seven. If you have uh, 15, you've got to see uh, eight of them. Um, and I, I was borderline, but the problem is I was on the wrong side of the border. Okay, crap. So they threw me out of the uh, FIP program, but because it was so late in the year as far as registration goes, there weren't any other liberal arts classes I could sign up for, so they let me take the ground school portion with the knowledge the highest grade I'd get would be a C, swell. Uh, my grades weren't that great anyway, and I didn't need another C, but at least it was something to do with aviation, and that's what held my interest. So I took the course, and uh, did. I got my C, that was fine. And um, then when it came time for graduation, there's this note on the uh, bulletin board, Holliker, see me, assignment. Oh, this ought to be interesting. So I walked in to see Sergeant Franz, and he said, hey, you're going to uh, aerospace munitions. Oh, okay. So I walked over and pulled out the uh, training manual and looked up what the prereqs were. And I'm going through, you got to have a college degree. Okay, you got to be a second lieutenant or an officer. Okay, fine. You got to have normal color vision. Son of a bitch. You know, you guys don't know your ass from a hole in the ground. And I mean, it just really, you know, it was good enough to go um, into munitions, but not pilot training. But I didn't say anything to anybody about that because I didn't want to end up in something like fuels management or some damn thing like that. So I just kept quiet. Okay, I'm good with it. But it, I began to feel deep-rooted resentment at that time. And I'm pretty sure that's the beginning of my senior year uh, is when my, um, uh, or mid, midway through my senior year, whatever it was, is when my uh, alcoholism began to kick in, unknowing to me, because I could drink a few beers and that pain just kind of went away. But it never did go away, as a uh, few of us know. So I graduate from uh, Bowling Green. I had the opportunity to fly down to uh, San Antonio to visit my folks. My dad was, civil, well, both of them were civil service at that time. Dad was a commissary officer out of Brooks Air Force Base. And mom worked in the flight surgeon's office at uh, headquarters air training command. So I get down there and uh, one day I drive out to the base. They, uh, they had pilot training there in those days. I drive out to the base walk over to uh, base operations and they had a curb outside of base ops. I sat down in that curb just watching the 38s take off and land and do touch and goes and I can remember thinking to myself God if only I had the chance I know I could do as well as those guys can are doing and I also know I I wouldn't splatter those airplanes on the runway like a couple of them are doing. Well, anyway, I just kind of left it at that. Um, again, just feeling that pain that I just didn't know how to deal with. But uh, a couple beers and that kind of went away, got tamped down. So off I went um, then to uh, Lowry Air Force Base. And then from Lowry, once I got out of training, I was assigned to Nellis Air Force Base in uh, Nevada to a F-111 squadron. And uh, truth be told, I loved that being in that squadron. And I liked and I enjoyed being a munitions officer. So anyway, I get out there and um, I got to thinking, well, I wonder if I took a flight physical on active duty, if they might cut me just a little bit of slack in the color vision department spe specifically. So I scheduled for a flight physical and I went over there and one morning and took the physical. Everything was going fine, sat down with the young airman and 
he pulled out those lethal color charts and for a couple of them I did okay and uh, like the black and white ones I did fine but then he got into the pink and green dots and all that crap and so I looked at this one color plate and I was looking at Chinese arithmetic as far as I could tell and so I said three he said uh, why don't you add five I said eight now I was always a lot better at math than I was at uh, at uh, these color plates so I passed well he took my physical sent it up to TAC TAC approved it sent it down to uh, San Antonio and when it got to San Antonio to uh, Randolph in the flight surgeon's office because I had had that test on record at Wright-Patterson where I failed and because color vision doesn't change I was disqualified oh man I was just heartbroken just heartbroken. I mean, oh man, that was tough. So I just, I didn't know what I was going to do. That would have been in February 69. So I just kind of went about the, the spring and the summer. And then um, come August, mom called me up and said, hey, Bobby, she said, the Air Force is recognizing a test given by the FAA now that they hadn't recognized in the past. She said, you took that at Wright-Patterson, didn't you? Well, I did. When I was at Wright-Pat, they wanted to know just how bad my color deficiency was. So they gave me this color threshold test, which the FAA uh, recognized, and I passed it. There were uh, <clears throat> eight different colors that you, you looked in this box, and they showed you eight different colors at eight different intensities. And you had to pass with, I think, a 48 or 50. And I passed with 52. So that was on my record. And as it turned out, that saved my ass as far as uh, becoming an Air Force pilot. So I told Mom, yeah, I passed that one. She said, well, she said, they just we just got the uh, regulation here uh, this morning. She said, uh, why don't you uh, go over to the flight surgeon's office if... And if they have any problem, we'll, we'll send them a copy of the reg or reference it, and you're good to go. So I went over to, um, oh, I told Mom, well, Mom, as much as I'd like to do that, I, I said, I've been knocked down so damn many times, I don't know if I really have it in me to try it again. And she said, listen, you little shit. She said, you get your ass over that flight surgeon's office, or I'm coming out there, and I'm going to drag you over myself. She says, all I've listened to you talk about since you've been about four, five, six years old was flying for the Air Force. Well, here's your chance now. You know, you get over there. Well, I knew not enough uh, not to argue with Mom, so I called, made an appointment, and over I went. Um, there were several people monitoring me taking the color vision test, but I took it, and I passed. And uh, off the application went. Got to TAC, TAC uh, looked at it, it all looked good, so they sent it on down to Randolph. When it got to Randolph, apparently there were these, um, there was a staff sergeant that worked in the back office along with his major, and both these guys, for whatever reason, had it in for Mom. Mom was the uh, ATC Surgeon General Secretary at the time, and I don't know if she got crossways with him or what, that, that, I don't know. But, um, I apparently had a filling that uh, needed to be filled. Not a big deal. But they bounced the damn um, um, flight uh, physical back to the base. Well, you know, in those days, we didn't have the electronic transmissions that we have today. So it's going by snail mail. So it just takes time. So the after, after a couple of weeks, where the, what the hell's going on? So I called down there and... I said, I haven't seen or, seen or heard anything on that application. Well, Mom went back and ferreted it out and learned about the filling that needed to be filled. And and she said, were you aware of this? I said, no, but I, I need to take care of it. So I went over to the dental, dental office, got the filling taken care of just that day. Not a big deal. Well, Mom had had it with this staff sergeant and this major, so she went into the two-star she worked for. And... Um, God, I can see him, but I can't think of his Jeffrey. I'll think of his name here, probably when I finish the video. Anyway, um, she explained everything to him, and he 
I guess he didn't take it too well. He called the major and the staff sergeant into his office and had a quiet come to Jesus with them. And then he called me and he said, Bobby, he says, I've looked, I personally looked at your application. Everything looks good. He says, you're coming to pilot training. He says, where would you like to come? And I said, sir, I said, uh, uh, it really doesn't matter to me. I said, I'm just thrilled to be accepted. I said, I said I'm just beyond expression to have this opportunity. So it really doesn't matter. He said, well, he said, I think we'll bring you to Randolph. He said, that's uh, the uh, showcase of the Air Force. And uh, he said, your folks are here. San Antonio is a great city. The weather's great. He said, I think you'd really enjoy going through the pilot training at Randolph Field. I said, sounds like a good deal. <laughs> and he said, it is, Bobby. So then he says, and one other thing, he says, that staff sergeant that got a little snotty with you and your, your application, he said he just got two sets of orders. One set sending him to Vietnam, and the next set is his follow-on assignment to Minot, North Dakota. He said the message I wanted to send to him is when you're a jeep, you don't screw with a tank. And um, if anything ever came of the major, I don't know. I never heard anything one way or the other. But the bottom line is um, I was going to Randolph and I was going to pilot training. It was an opportunity I was given, and I knew how hard it was to get into uh, pilot training, and I was not going to um, screw it up. Um, once I got that assignment, and I got into the training, and I got my wings, I never looked back. I just had a ball from then on out. So. I guess this is probably one of the first stories I should have told you, but this is where it all began. And I lived, I got a chance to live my dream. And uh, I'm just so grateful for it. Anyway, I'll tell you more about it as we uh, go along here on this journey. Nice to see everybody and hope you have a great 2024.